Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is midnight in London, 7 p.m. here in New York, 4 o'clock in Los Angeles, and in the besieged nation of Ukraine, the time is 2 o'clock in the morning. My name is Jonathan Silver from the Tikva Fund. I'm the editor of our online magazine, Mosaic, and I'll be your host for this evening's briefing on the war in Ukraine and what it means with Elliot Abrams. In a few minutes, we'll get to all that is happening there and what it means for the nations of Eastern Europe, and all of the larger geopolitical questions that Russia's invasion invites. Our purpose at Tikva is to ask these kinds of political and strategic questions, and I'm thrilled that so many of you have joined us for this purpose. But I should say that if you want to support the very practical and desperate needs of Ukrainian Jews right now, some large number of whom are fleeing from their homes, then there are other organizations who undertake that important work. Some of you will want to support the work of the AJC or Hatsala or Chabad, and we're going to put links to those organizations in the chat. That generosity is vital and a testament to who we are as a people. But of course, at Tikva, we are not engaged in that kind of important work, so it's a pleasure to lend some support to those who do at this hour in the history of our people. What do we do? Well, our purpose is to first try to understand what's happening in the most granular and in the largest sense, and then to try to take a step beyond that and ask what it means for America, for Israel, for the future of the West. And no one can really better do that than our chairman, a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, chairman of the Vandenberg Coalition, and of course, chairman of the Tikva Fund, Elliot Abrams. Mr. Abrams has worked in government at the highest levels, working with Secretary Pompeo as the Trump administration's special envoy to Venezuela and then to Iran, before that on the National Security Council of the Bush administration, and before that with uh, senior appointments in the State Department, uh, including with the human rights portfolio. I'm going to ask Elliot to speak for a few minutes and tell us what's happening in Ukraine, what he knows and how he reads what's happening there. We'll talk for a few minutes back and forth. Then at about 7.30 or so, I'll invite your questions. It will be, uh, so please write them down now as they occur to you, and we'll open things up in about half an hour. Elliot, we could start uh, with the historical precedents and all of the things that led to this moment, but I'd rather begin in a more practical way, not with 1989 or 2014 or the many relevant dates uh, aside from those. We'll come to them in the course of our discussion I want to begin on February 24th, two weeks ago, when Russian forces moved into Ukraine. At that moment, what do we know about what Vladimir Putin was thinking and what he wanted to get out of this? Well, John, it's, um, it's a pleasure to uh, be with you and to be doing this tonight for Tikva. I would distinguish first uh, between what we know and what we think. What we know, I believe, in terms of intelligence that we've gotten. What Putin said to this Russian general and that lieutenant of his new company, we don't know. We judge by his statements and by his actions. Um, and I would say that we can, we should believe uh, that he thought first that having gotten let me, let me put it a different way. First came Georgia um, and the Donbass and Crimea. This is really number four for Putin. And in those three steps, he got real, no real pushback. This happened under Republican and Democratic administrations. So that's not a partisan comment. It happened over 15 years, no real, 14 years, no real pushback. So I think it's fair to believe that he thought he would do it again with a larger prize now, all of or most of Ukraine. Take it over, push the Zerensky government out, put in a puppet government, and uh, be in a position to frighten the Europeans, to frighten the NATO countries, uh, which would never get together and never do anything against him. And of course, succeeding in this would only enhance his own position uh, internally against Democrats in 
Russia, and it would enhance its position globally in the Middle East, in Europe, and vis-a-vis -vis the much wealthier and larger and more powerful China. So from his point of view, I think, it looked like uh, lots of gain, a very low risk. And he also believed that the Russian military was capable of doing this as easily again as they did say um, Crimea or Georgia or the Donbass. Uh, so he believed a number of things that turned out not to be true, but all indications are that's what he believed. Have you been surprised by what's happened over the last two weeks? Sure. Uh, first, I did not think it was certain he would go in. Um, second, <clears throat> I think everyone is surprised and gratified by the intensity of the Ukrainian resistance, which has been really extraordinary, and the military quality of that resistance. It's both popular and professional. Third, of course, um, I think it's really difficult to say anyone would have predicted the extraordinarily extraordinary solidarity of Europe. I mean, Germany is the best example. A Germany that spends, I exaggerate, but nothing on defense. Uh, a Germany whose former chancellor is in Putin's pocket, Schroeder. A Germany that gets half its energy from Russia uh, and has a new government, Merkel is gone. Uh, no one, I think, could have predicted that Chancellor Schultz in Germany would flip on a dime um, and, and in a sense go back to being Cold War Germany. So I think there have been a lot of surprises, and many of them, except for the invasion itself, um, positive surprises. I would have to say that when you think about what Russia has done in other struggles like Chechnya, the brutality of the Russian um, approach is not a surprise. And I think, you know, serious analysts predict that, that could get much darker and worse in the coming days. I don't think that Putin can withdraw. <clears throat> I thought that was possible in the first few days. It hadn't been much damage, hadn't been much loss of life. One could envision some compromises. Uh, envision them. Uh, the Ukrainians might have rejected them. But now, now I think both sides have, uh, both sides being Ukraine, the country, the people, and Vladimir Putin not Russia, but Putin, um, have too much to lose. So I think what that means is that uh, Putin's instructions to the military will be um, just destroy whatever you have to until they, until you've taken Kiev. Oi, my lights, my lights turned off. It's all right. Okay. Because when they did, your power did not go off. Yes, yes, indeed. Um well, look, I mean, I think that there is, uh, what, can, what can one learn? There's so many things that one can learn from this moment. What one learns about a nation when it is most under strain and under stress, when it's pressured in ways that are unpredicted, reveals something about the character of that nation. We're certainly learning something about the courage and the heroism of the women and men of Ukraine right now, and its surprising, impressive leader. We're learning something about Putin and the way he thinks about uh, the way he thinks about himself and Russia. You just told us something that we're learning about uh, Germany, which is fascinating. What what are we learning about America and America's? Uh, what what should we be doing? What are we not doing? What have you? What struck you about the American reaction to all this? Let me just start by saying <clears throat> you're right about Ukraine. And what we're learning is that. Um, <laughs> the disproof of the ludicrous Putin line <clears throat> that Ukraine is not a real country, really part of Russia. What we're finding is that Ukraine is a lot more like Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, the Czech Republic, real countries with real patriotic nationalist populations that do not want to be ruled from Moscow. What are we learning about um, ourselves? We're learning that we have the ability to do good diplomatic work in helping to unify NATO 
And the president has, I think, been emphatic in saying, uh, quote, Article 5 is sacrosanct, which he had to say, and had he failed to say it, we would be in a much worse um, situation. So I think we're learning that the immediate diplomatic work and military work, the immediate work is taking place. For example, uh, we have moved thousands and thousands of troops east into Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and uh, material with them. Troops that had been stationed in Germany? Troops that had been stationed in Germany and some who had been stationed in the U.S. We're also learning, I think, though, that uh, as a country, we're, we are not yet fully cognizant of the changes in our situation. Um, the example I would give is the president's State of the Union message, um, in which he did not say two things that I think would have been beneficial to him and to the country. First, politically, he did not say, once upon a time, we all believe that politics stops at the water's edge. On national security issues, we have to overcome partisanship. And there are ways symbolically and really that he could have reached out. Secondly, I think we have not fully come to the realization that we're gonna need to spend a lot more money on defense. When John Kennedy became president, we spent 9% of GDP on defense. Then it went down, went down to six and five and Reagan brought it up to 6.6. .6. Then it went down to five and then to four and under four. Now Congress today is moving to add to the defense budget, which is a very good thing, but we're gonna to need to add a substantial amount and we're gonna to need to continue it over time. We had a kind, even with Afghanistan and Iraq, we had a kind of 30 year holiday after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, you know, I think we have to recognize we are in a new and dangerous uh, Cold War that could in some places get hot as it has gotten hot in Ukraine. Well, this is, this is clearly the subject of a major new essay that you've just published in National Review. Why don't you just lay out for us how you came to this conclusion? What makes you think that this one incursion spells a new geopolitical reality that would put us in a new Cold War? There are a few things that happened this year that I think lead one to that conclusion. The first of you is the extraordinary alignment of Russia and China. On February 4th, Putin went to China um, and a communique was issued that uh, creates a new partnership between the two that they say um, will really be closer than anything in the Cold War. And they talk about color revolutions and essentially say that um, we are, no country can leave their camp. You may remember the Brezhnev Doctrine. If you're in the Soviet camp, you stay there. And they're pretty much saying the same thing. If you're near Russia or China, you belong in their camp and under their thumb. That was February 4th. Then you began to see more and more arguments in the last few months about how prior to Ukraine, we need to concentrate on China. This is the great challenge of the 21st century. And that means we have to turn away from everything else. The Middle East doesn't matter. The uh, Europe doesn't matter. Oh, NATO, you know, these are all old, come on, old think. And now we see Ukraine first and the utility and the importance of NATO. Then we see we need to be going to the Middle Easterners and saying, well, we have a global energy problem. We need to talk to you, our, we think, allies about oil supplies. We cannot turn away from Europe. We cannot turn away from the Middle East. We have a global challenge against two, uh, in some ways, capacious, um, competent, in some ways, enemies, China and Russia. And the analogy I gave was, you know, think of World War II and World War I. We, how did we win those wars? The old American way, we simply overwhelmed with manpower and materiel and it was obvious to Europeans, the day we entered the war, the war was over. We just didn't know the date. 
you know, there are quotes from Churchill and the leading, the top British generals. The day, a few days after Pearl Harbor, that Hitler declared war on the United States, the war was over. As the British knew, okay, we don't know if it'll take a year, maybe it takes two years, maybe it takes four years, it's over. The Americans are obviously going to overwhelm everyone else. That's not true today. What would have happened if instead of it being Germany and Japan against the US, the British Empire and Russia, Soviet Russia, what if the Soviets had aligned themselves with Germany, uh, Nazi Germany and Japan? It would have been a very different war. It's kind of what we are going to face now. The alignment of Russia led by a vicious and brutal killer with China, with all of its military, economic, scientific, technological resources. That's, that's what we face. And I think that's much, much clearer now than it was several months ago. Well, there's so many things that I want to pick up. I want to go back to the China part of this and the China-Russia relationship and how we should understand it as a strategic vulnerability. Of course, you mentioned that uh, each of those nations are prodigious and powerful. They also have their vulnerabilities, which we should be aware of. But I actually want to go back um, first to what you ended with, which is um, some of Churchill's generals came to the view that, that several days after Pearl Harbor, when America joined the fight, the war was over, but the date was not yet known. I'm not sure that we have we, we are creating the same sort of uh, impression in European allies today. And I wonder what it would take short of the imposition of a no-fly zone. You could comment on uh, this idea and whether it's valuable and how dangerous it is and so on. But what would it take for us to be less negotiating diplomatic support behind the scenes and more strengthening the spine in material ways of our allies in Europe? I think it takes two things. <clears throat> One that we're doing a bit of, we could do more of, um, is being there physically. Um, on the frontiers of NATO, just as an example, we all say, and the president says, we want to support Ukraine. And if Kyiv falls and there's a puppet regime put in, I'm confident we will recognize a government in exile and we will continue to send supplies to the guerrilla war that will take place. From where? Poland. I mean, if you look at the map, it's Poland. Now, the Russians will want to stop that. That means that we will need to have forces in Poland, and more than we have now, uh, to protect Poland and to make it clear to Putin that he can't touch Poland or any of the other members of, of NATO. Um, that's one thing we are beginning to do, but we, I think, should do more of. Then you get to the no-fly zone. And the thinking about it is very interesting to me. Today, the spokesman for the Defense Department said, and I'm, you know, I'm paraphrasing, this is a bad idea. Because if you have a no-fly zone over Ukraine, you're going to come into contact with Russian jets and the Russian and American jets be firing at each other. And so you'll be expanding the conflict. Now, you know, in a way that's obviously right, but think again, Ukraine is a sovereign country. It has a government. The government invites NATO, invites the United States to help it protect itself and its airspace. Um, what, what the Defense Department is saying, however, is, well, yeah, but, the Russians own that airspace now. Or the Russians and the Ukrainians are fighting it out. It's no business of ours. Why is it that that's an escalation by the United States if we do that, rather than by Russia? Um, I don't, you know, Russian planes have been shot down. I remember when Turkey shot one down over Syria, nothing happened. So we are, in a sense, saying we are, we are, really reluctant to have that confrontation. Um, what is the message of that to all of our allies and to Putin? It seems to me that it's a very bad message and it's a bad message about Taiwan too. 
And as we think about Ukraine and messages, we should always think, you know, what is Xi Jinping making of this? Right. Um, but I, uh, I understand the reluctance about the no-fly zone. But what we're saying, if we say we can't do it because we might have a confrontation with Russia, sends a terrible message. Which is that we, we mentally have already ceded that ground to Russia. Uh, we have. Or that airspace, that is. Or, or the, the president has, the Defense Department has. Yeah. The Ukrainians haven't. But on that, we're not, we're backing them up in the sense that, you know, we're sending uh, stingers and we're sending air defenses. Um, but I wonder, you know, today we saw a maternity hospital bombed. In error, it's conceivable because the Russians have not been doing all that well. Uh, but it's also conceivable that it was done deliberately. It's a campaign of terror to say to the Ukrainian people, you're going to get much, much more of this if you don't give up. How much more of this are we prepared to watch without doing anything? I mean, that's a that very question is sort of a question that leaders have, of course, have to ask themselves. Um, not irrelevant to that question is the sort of appetite of the American people to uh, to undertake the fight. We, I think we've seen some very interesting, at least to me, interesting because um, I'd been sort of listening to our leaders tell us and repeat in campaign slogans and so on how sick we all are of, of uh, foreign interventions and forever wars. Um, but in truth, right now, it seems as if the American people are much more willing to support Ukraine than not. I think that's right. I mean, there are, there are polls. Um, there are polls about Taiwan, by the way, too, that are remarkably, what word should, I was going to say aggressive, that's really not the right word, because it would be defensive, but um, we're talking here about leadership. <clears throat> and I think the American people would respond to leadership here. Again, people watch the TV um, and they see what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, there's no question which side Americans are on. So <clears throat> if the president were to say, we have to do this, and let me explain why. Um, and, and, and again, do this in a kind of bipartisan manner, which I still think is possible. Um, I think there would be extremely wide support. Okay, um, there's a lot of questions that one would have about what's happening, you know, more, more uh, tactically on the ground. Um, but we don't have a, a, an endless amount of time. I want to go to another thing that you mentioned before and pick up on the Russia-China relationship. Um, you know, the, the analogy of the Cold War is illuminating, but one of the big differences that comes to mind is that in those years, Russia was the senior partner of that <laughs> friendship alliance, yep. and now it's very much the other way around. Uh, I, I suppose the question, the main question I would ask is, um, if we have any indication of what the Chinese leadership is thinking, did they make a good bet here based on the performance of the Russian military? Again, John, I, I would say know what they're thinking. No, I don't think we know it. <clears throat> we, um, we try to figure it out. You were right about the partnership. I mean, it was the Soviet Union uh, with, with initially Mao's China. Um, Russia is now only about 150 million people and declining demographically uh, very rapidly. It's a one crop economy with oil. Uh, it doesn't have anything like the, obviously the size, but the technology, the economic weight of China. So that's really changed. What are they thinking? I think they're watching. Okay, uh, no one told Putin to do this. Putin decided he didn't have to. There was no crisis. He decided to do it. Let's see. So I think they're watching the, the poor performance of the Russian military. Uh, they may know more about the Russian military than we do, but I think most people are surprised by the poor quality of the uh, work they're doing. Um, they'll be very much watching Western unity and how we respond, again, partly having Taiwan in mind. They'll be very much um, interested in what happens to Putin. I mean, <clears throat> if the Ukrainians hold on and hold on, and this turns into a terrible guerrilla war, and Putin 
grows increasingly unpopular at home and even falls. What a lesson for Xi Jinping. Now, I think they're studying this with enormous attention. Uh, <clears throat> there's another dimension to the declaration of war uh, directly between the West and NATO and the United States and Russia. And that's sort of the uh, frame of mind that people are evaluating the whole question of the no-fly zone in. But I think that there's another arena in which there is an outright war declared and, and uh, being waged, and that is in the economic realm. And I wonder if you can comment on that. Are we doing the right things? What more should we be doing? We're doing more than I thought and more quickly. <clears throat> uh, we are and the Europeans are. And the president rightly said there is pain here. Any of uh, the people on here today who passed a gas station will have, I think, done a double take. I did. I was in New York this morning and passed a gas station in Queens, and it was 4.38 a gallon, uh, which, which we have really never seen. Um, uh, I, I think um, the European reaction, again, the German reaction, has been quicker than anticipated because they do get so much of their energy from Russia. Now, one has to stop and just say, um, I think history is going to judge Angela Merkel much more negatively than uh, she was judged as she left office. Her 16 years in office are the years in which Germany became dependent on Russian energy, uh, didn't build an LNG ports, uh, stopped using nuclear energy, Russia, Russia, Russia. Um, so uh, we were doing a lot we have agreed to take on a certain amount of pain, as have the Europeans. We're fortunate that it's, you know, only a month or so before the end of, of winter. Uh, what more should we be doing? Um, I think we should be going after every additional names, let's say. Um, we've hit some of the oligarchs. There are more people at the higher end of the Russian political structure. Um, in, well, they don't really have branches of government, but but cronies of Putin who, um, who could and should be named. I do not think we should be chasing after Iran and Venezuela to put more oil on the market. I think to show seriousness to the European allies, to Russia, to China, we should be putting more American oil on the market. And it's remarkable to me, I mean, this sounds like a slogan, but it it really is true. You know, we want to open more oil supplies from Venezuela and Iran, but won't open the XL pipeline um, and won't allow more uh, production here. It's not an overnight solution. You know, the production can't be ramped up overnight, but it's it's symbolic of one's or a nation's priorities. And that, like an increase in the defense budget, would be a message to uh, allies and enemies. We're in this for the long haul. We get it. So, Ali, there's, there's uh, yet another dimension of the Cold War analogy um, that is that I'm fixated on. There was a, uh, again, to go back to your point about leadership and uh, democratic leadership, in le leading a country and persuading the women and men who live there about why it's important to support what we're doing, there was a, a rhetorical mainstay of Cold War leadership that was all about uh, supporting democracies. That that was an essential part. Now, it, it wasn't thought to be a sort of airy-fairy, uh, nice add-on. It was part of our arsenal. And I wonder if you think that, you're, if you're persuaded that that has a place in the Cold War that's coming into being, or you think it's it, it, it was a luxury that we can no longer afford. I think that abandoning the cause of democracy and human rights is a luxury we cannot afford. Um, nobody got this more clearly than Ronald Reagan, uh, who presided over a great military buildup, but understood that this was also a war of ideas, that the difference between the Soviet Union and the United States was not that we had better cars. It was a difference, but it wasn't the key difference. Reagan got it. The key difference was freedom. 
And you see this in Ukraine. I mean, all Ukrainians understand this is not solely about national sovereignty. It is about that. But they and everyone else who escaped from the Soviet empire know it is also about freedom. And they're, you know, we're coming back to the use of terms like the free world here. Uh, in the struggle with China, there are national issues. And on our side, there are countries like Cambodia and Vietnam that are afraid of China, as well as obviously Japan, Australia, South Korea, India. Um, look, <clears throat> uh, a government is not an NGO. We're never going to have a pure policy. We're never going to have a camp that consists of 100% democracies. But in this struggle, one of the great weapons of the United States is our association with the cause of freedom. And people around the world know it. And they know it even more this week than they did two weeks ago. So it's a great strength. And uh, to fail to build on that strength and use that strength would be uh, weakening our side and our cause. So this is a, a meeting that's brought together by us at Tikva. So it, it, uh, we, we cannot go without asking about the role that, uh, of Israel in all of this. Yep. And I, I would do want to ask this, there's this very interesting, it's hard to know exactly what to make of it, but this teeny tiny little country um, with a brand new prime minister is being called upon to, uh, to meet with, I think the first foreign leader to meet face to face with Putin since this all started. I don't know if that's, but yep. that's an amazing thing. And, and, and how should one understand yes. it? And, and, and yeah. if you were to now just give us some insight into the way that the Israeli government might be thinking about this, tell us how yeah. to understand it. Well, um, Israel has had a relationship with Putin. Putin is a very strange character, a KGB agent who likes Jews. Um, even today in Russia, in the middle of this, there, there is no government-sponsored anti-Semitism. Putin has had a good relationship with Israel. With Israel, for a while, people said, no, no, it's just BB has it. No, it's Israel, because Bennett picked up on it immediately. Now, you know, where that comes from psychologically and so forth, historically, person, that's a different question. But it's there. He's never shown any hostility to Israel. So the Israelis have a relationship with him that many other countries don't. I think Bennett obviously was also trying to get some of the heat off Israel for failing to be so clearly 100% in the American-European camp. And the balancing the Israelis are doing is, you know, for example, they did not uh, support the Security Council resolution against Russia, but they supported the General Assembly resolution. What are they doing here? You know, Natan Sharansky, I think, unsurprisingly, explained it very well. We put them in this position. The main problem they have right now is Iran. We, we the Americans. We, the United States. Their main security problem is Iran. And Iran, which has control of Lebanon through Hezbollah, wanted also to get control, wants to get control of Syria. So to have the whole north. Um, and the Israelis are fighting that. And they've been hitting Syria probably about once a week for years, year after year after year, trying to prevent Iran from taking over Syria. And in this, they have needed Russian cooperation. Why Russian? Because we abandoned Syria in the Obama administration. You remember the famous red line? Uh, we would not permit the use of gas. And then... The red line was abandoned. So in order for the Israelis to be able to keep fighting Iran and Syria, they need to work with the Russians. The Russians are there. The Russian Air Force is there. And they have a deconfliction relationship. Um, it's critical to their security. We are seeing uh, the Gulf Arab states go back and forth also and not want to take hotly anti-Russian positions. And again, it's it's because Middle Easterners, Arab and Israeli, uh, came to the conclusion that the United States was doing what it said it was doing, trying to get out of the Middle East, where the Russians were moving in. 
So the Israelis are trying to balance this and balance it with their national security. Now, Sharansky's view is we have one great ally. It's the United States. And we simply need to be with the United States, period. End of statement. But it's clearly not the view of the government of Israel, nor of the military establishment in Israel, because they're focused on Syria. Um, I, I was the last time I went to Israel as a government official, it's about a year ago, a um, little over a year ago, Trump administration. I heard the same thing from the Saudis, the Emiratis, and the Israelis about Syria, which was we cannot allow Iran to get control of Syria. We have to deal with Russia. We have to deal with Assad. But keep your eye on the ball. It's Iran. And that's what the Israelis are doing. Uh, with this fascinating analysis, Elliot, thank you very much. We adjourn. Thank you, John. Good night.